Watch all episodes of Ice Pilots. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. On this episode of Ice Pilots and WT. So this is it. Mikey's D-Day tribute jump is a go. Yeah, see it up in there. But the drop zone is a pilot's nightmare. I didn't like it, so I turned around. And Joe wants to call the whole thing off. I ain't gonna do it. There's 30 guys coming. I ain't going in there, no DC-3. Boy. It's June in Yellowknife and a special day on the Buffalo ramp. But you know, it's setting in, I'm getting a little bit nervous, so it's gonna be pretty quick when we jump out of this airplane, so. Mikey has just 36 hours to execute a plan two years in the making. He's taking two dozen paratroopers to jump out of his special DC-3 to commemorate the 70th anniversary of D-Day, the Allied invasion of occupied France in World War II. Ready. ready for this? No, I am not ready for this. <laughs> Corey and Mikey are going to jump, too, from 12,000 feet. We're leaving with WZS here any moment, and uh, we're off to Red Deer to start the whole D-Day adventure, so I'm pretty excited. Hey, are there enough seats in here for everybody? There should be, yeah. Uh, shut or is. A lot of difference between shut and is. I say shit and piss. The cabin of WZS has been reconfigured to drop paratroopers. I gotta fire it up, so. Joe, Mikey, and Corey are heading to Red Deer, Alberta, base camp for the D-Day jump. Joe has asked Buffalo's greenest rookie, Sam Storm, to be his co-pilot. It's quite a privilege to be asked to fly with Joe on a D-Day flight. So many years ago, it was pilots just like me, probably the same amount of experience or less doing exactly this in the same airplane. But before they can even get off the ground, things start going wrong. Can you program his GPS? I can, I don't know how you have it yet though. Oh, well, why didn't you? I need to tell the go on it. I need a flight plan or a GPS. Yeah, I can get a flight plan. Anybody move an envelope back here? What? I had an envelope with all my paperwork and it's gone. Hey, is my uh, envelope full of paperwork in the office? Yeah, want me to run it out to you? Yes, please. Sam gets his flight plan hand delivered. Thank you. I thought he had his airplane ready for me. It's taken a lot of planning. And for Mikey, a crash diet and exercise regimen to get this D-Day tribute jump off the ground. Yeah, two years of work. Up until the moment we took off from the night, it was really just bar talk. And now that we're, you know, spending fuel to get there, it's becoming more and more real. There's 30 inches. Mikey's invited 12 American Green Berets to jump with the 12 Canadians. Everything's ready. We have approval from Parliament Building to Pentagon. Europe. At this point, I don't really even care about my jump as much as I care about the military's jump and all the veterans and people there waiting to see if we can do it. But all of Mikey's planning is nothing compared to the real D-Day. It took over a year of preparation and training before launching the huge 1944 offensive. Thousands of men housed in camps across southern England awaited the launch of a secret mission to cross the English Channel and land on the beaches of Normandy. D-Day was the largest seaborne invasion in history and turned the tide in the war. Now, only hours before the jump, Mikey's fear of heights is really hitting him. I'm scared sh shitless right now, oh, to be all fully honest with you. Flying, uh, just flying up here with WZS, looking out the window, kind of thinking, you know, I'm going to have to jump out of there. So, yeah. 
How high do you want to go, and, and, and what's my turn radius in the mountains there? That's all. Mikey calls a last-minute meeting with the armed forces, and Joe finds out Mikey will be skydiving, harnessed to a trained jumper. So you guys aren't going out on a cable? No, we're going to do tandem, because originally I wanted to do that, but that would have been three weeks of training. You, didn't, you only gave me one showers off. <laughs> What is the history of, of tandem jumping? Is it safe or is it risky? Or? It's more than safe. I took my wife on the tandem. She said she's still with me. <laughs> Are you done? Joe is having second thoughts about the whole mission. Not every father in the world wants to see his son jump out of the back of the airplane. He's flying and turn around to see him make sure his parachute open. What I'll do is I'll go with the Baron and have a close place. Mm -hmm. I want to go myself. I'll just give me the dry runner. He wasn't 100% on board of this project from day one. So I'm kind of nervous that he can use the reconnaissance flight to say it's a no-go. But before I go in there with a DC-3, I want to go ahead and have a look, see what my turning radius is, you know? If it's not totally safe, it ain't going to happen. I want to see if it's suitable for a DC-3 to be in the mountains at that weight, at that altitude, at that time, a day. Hey, did you mark it on here, Sam, where we're going? Here, I'll show you. Okay, give me the lap long and put it on there. And make sure it's right. Yep. I'll go get that. I don't know what Joe's thinking, but it must be different in his mind. That's his kid, you know? Straight line, Joe. As the moment got closer and closer, I really think that was going through Joe's head. If Joe doesn't think the drop zone is safe, the D-Day celebrations will be over before they start. The drop zone the military chose is deep in the Canadian Rockies, 100 kilometers to the west. Abraham Lake is surrounded by four peaks, all named after battles fought by Canadian paratroopers in World War II. The paratroopers will land in the water where there's less chance of injury. Just going right there. Yeah. See the shadows down there? Yeah, because of the cloud, you can't see the, the small hill, right? You see the big one? Right. What's this mountain? Oh, hi. That's about 7,900 feet over here. But paratroopers drop from only 1,200 feet, which means Joe has to come in low, threading through the mountains. Uh, one behind it. There's 81. And the ones on the far side over there at 95. For now, they keep a safe altitude above the peaks so Joe can get a look at the drop zone. What are the six that spot? Do they have an alder in spot? I don't think so. Joe isn't impressed. I'm telling you, no, I'm taking the DC-3 down 1,200 feet in there. Well, yeah, they want us to come up from the north, too. Yeah, no, I won't do it. Track to Red Deer? Yep. Shad Red Deer, it's uh, for Dog 3. They head back to give Mikey the bad news. No, I gotta talk to Mikey. That ain't gonna happen for me. Well, I ain't going there, no DC-3. What's the predicament? Doesn't look good, or what? No, it was really steep. Really? <laughs> Here he comes now. <clears throat> well, big guy, you're going to have to find an alternate means of compliance. You ain't going in there no DC-3. It's too rough, too many shadows, too narrow, no way out. Nothing's good about it. Mikey's commemorative D-Day jump with the U.S. and Canadian Armed Forces is just one day away. There's 30 guys coming right now. You can't get in there, Mike, because it's too tight and there's no way out. Joe has deemed the steep mountain valley too dangerous for a low-altitude drop. So in the valley, can you turn around if you need to get out? No, I'm not turning around that valley. Now with a load of DC. Yeah, so it's too tight. Eh? So even if a losing engine, you're kind of hooped. Those aren't mountains, those are granite walls. Well, he spent a week there. You think these guys know what they're doing? Well, then they got to get one of those guys to fly the airplanes. They ain't going to fly it. Yeah. The whole years and the making of this whole DJ thing is coming to an end, like right there with one simple flight. No, Mark, if there was any way I could do it, I'd do it, but 
All right. There's 30 people on their way here. We got to figure out a solution. I know there's 30 people on my way, and everybody depending on it, but I don't have a way out if things go sideways on me. Oh, my God. Because we're f***ed. We don't have a drop zone. We don't have full pilot confidence right now. And we have a lot of people depending on us to do things right. And it's less than 24 hours. I don't know how, but we'll f <laughs> Two dozen elite paratroopers and their commanders are set to arrive tomorrow morning. Somebody's got to break the bad news. Well, we got to go on the phone with the military right now. You talk. There's 30 guys coming right now. We got to figure out a plan. We're good, Dave. Hey, uh, I just, we got a major problem. Uh, my father just got back from the lake. Uh, he's very concerned about uh, the, the, the physical location to get the airplane down to 1,200 feet in that area. I was flying the airplane, and I ain't going to do it, so. OK. Uh, what would you be able to do if you can't go down to 12 With the DC-3 loaded, uh, with, it's just not going to happen. Look, at, I know where I went. I know what I seen. And uh, I know where I was. I have, I have some knowledge of reading the map. And uh, when I seen where I was expected to go in and come out of, I'm turning it down. So I'm just sorry about that. Now, I don't want to argue about it all day. No, I just we, can't do it. We, we, instead of trying to find a solution, my father come back angry. So he's not doing it, blah, blah, blah. He's not listening. I'm sorry about that, but no, that's no, my we, decision. You've got, you got to work at it. We, got, we could still figure this out. So let me, let me give you a call back. Yeah, take Mike. Mike, if you were 20 miles either side of it, it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. And that whole area is not going to work for a DC-3 loaded on a summer day. It, it's just a bad choice of places. I mean, oh my God! You don't believe me, Mike? Well, no, I don't believe. I know where I was. I know what I seen. Well, how in the and hell? I ain't going. They, how in the hell can they stay there for a week and pick the absolute worst spot? They've never flown a DC-3 in the mountains. So, you know. It's like a mining guy telling you you can land on his creek bed. Uh, my father told the military on the phone, we're not doing it. And that's not the way we do things. We always find a solution. We came a long ways. It's been a long journey. We got to figure it out, so. Where the Sam? Sam ain't going to help you, Mike, because I ain't going in. Hey, Sam, get your maps and show me exactly where you guys went. So there's this. There's nothing like here, right? So he's popping over at 10,000. That's his problem. It's like from here to here is really tight. Shit. Abraham Lake is in the Rockies and surrounded by 9,000 foot peaks. The plan is to enter the valley and drop down to just over 1,000 feet and release the paratroopers fast. But the valley is tight for a DC-3 to turn around in. Joe would have to climb over the steep peaks, a risky move in a fully loaded plane with high winds coming off the mountains. Worst of all, there's no possible escape route if an engine fails. Joe's right. You know, we're not dropping chips off at Del and A, we're he's dropping the sun off in the mountains. So I'm a little bit glad that he's being a stickler, but we gotta get the job done too. I gotta think of a backup plan. No matter what, I'm jumping out of something somewhere. Hello? Hey, Dave, it's Mikey. Guys, at this point, we just, Abraham Lake is out um, for the low level drop. Just how far ahead we are already with all the time. We can do on the north side or the northern half of Abraham Lake. I was told by the military that Abraham Lake is the only place that we have approval to drop. So if we can't find a zone anywhere on the lake, the day is done. Oh my God, why does this always happen? He says he's he can get approval for anywhere here. Like this place wouldn't work up here, would it? Would it be better? Where is that? Oh, right. Uh... The lake is 36 kilometers long. There's got to be at least one place we can drop a couple of guys. Like this is a lot wider here. Like that whole space is like twice yeah. as wide. So I don't know if it's it'd be up to Joe because if he thinks he can make that area his maneuvering area. We're here. We're ready to go. We have all the approvals in the world. It's up to one man. Jesus Christ. Mikey thinks he's found a safer drop zone, but he still needs to convince Joe. <clears throat> so the military 
figures, is there any option for that? We ain't going in that valley, Mike. Nothing on the lake? No, I ain't going in there, Mike. You know, everyone's kind of, you know, thinking that maybe my father's doing this because he doesn't want me to jump. He's just putting up walls. We get, you, to put this in perspective, we have 24 guys, 12 are Green Berets of the US. The Canadian Forces guys are just fresh from Afghanistan, and everyone's been looking forward to this for a year. So it's not just a bunch of hillbillies jumping out. Then when are they coming? They're here tomorrow. I can see he was under a lot of pressure and stress to make sure it happens. He was 99% there, and, and I was the last 1%. And uh, just when he got to the finish line, I moved the finish line on him. So I, I knew I had to sit down and reassess where we we're going to drop. Where's your other map? In the barn. Just take a walk over. Is that the map I'm looking for? Uh, yep. I jump right in here and hit the Bighorn River. Well, dump right there, and they could drift into the water. It's an alternate spot. They didn't hit Juno Beach in all the right spots either, did they? This mission, which reads so easily, calls for an attack from England on the continent of Europe. Back in 1943, there was also a disagreement about where an Allied invasion should occur. Churchill pushed for an invasion from the Mediterranean, while Eisenhower wanted to cross the Channel to France. The operation was so big and complex that landing in northern France won out. Hey, Dave, it's Mikey. OK, um, good news. I got uh, talking with my father, and uh, I, we believe that the north, very north part of the, the lake, uh, there might be enough uh, of a bowl, um, you know, with the mountains to, to do a turn. OK, perfect. Yeah, I'll discuss it with them, and then we'll get back to you. OK, thanks. But the new plan isn't in place for 10 minutes before a cloud bank appears on the horizon. See that cloud out there now? That's exactly where you're going. You're going exactly to where that CB is out there. You wouldn't go out there now because it's shake the living snot out of you. you know? Man, like my brain can't process what happened today. And the weather is, is going to be an issue. Everyone get some good sleep tonight. Back here a couple hours, see if they didn't change in that wind. It's 7 a.m. June 5th, the day before the 70th anniversary of D-Day. Whiskey Zulu Sierra, WZS. After yesterday's mad scramble to change the drop zone, Mikey just woke up to more bad news. Well, it's going to get bad and good at midnight. The jump is scheduled for 5 p.m. today, but if the storm at the drop zone doesn't clear by then, WZS is grounded. The uh, weather pretty well dictates when and where and how. And the weather leading up to the jump was not in our favor. Right on time, 24 Canadian and US paratroopers file in, ready for action. I can see you again. But Mikey is it. So this is a crew, eh? This is. Hi right, guys. The plane's almost ready. <laughs> Got to find that number one engine. So, yeah, thanks guys for coming. I'm Mikey. Yeah, the, the aircraft were, uh, we're going to be up in was built in uh, Oklahoma City in 1942. Uh, it was shipped to Montreal where the Royal Air Force converted it to a Dakota 3. And then it flew over to uh, to um, England. Yeah, my father bought it. When did you buy that? In 78. 78. That airplane was one of the last few that are still in existence that was actually at the beach that day. I think what really changed for my father is when the military showed up. Because before then, it was just me. I think that was the turning point. Can you make it? Can I here? No, I haven't. Yeah, how's it going? Dave. You're in charge? Yes, yeah, sir. You're the man. How's it going? Yeah. Well, I'm running about two hours out of my weather here. OK. They want us out there at 5.30. Yeah. But I don't think the, the wind's going to subside that quickly. OK. OK, fair enough. If you need me there at 5.30, I can't do it. There's a possibility I can do it at 6.30. If I can't get there, I can just come back. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, we we'll do. You OK with that, sir? Yeah. Joe agrees to give it a shot, but if the weather's bad, 
He's turning back. Hey. Yeah. At the jump zone at Abraham Lake. Hey, just listen up. Is there any final questions? The military ground crew is also ready for the jump. Okay, let's do it. We're the drop zone control team. We're going to be out in the boats uh, calling the drop in and as well retrieving paratroopers out of the water. Your eyes are going to be big and your asshole is going to be really small at this point. Mm -hmm. That's normal, right? Mikey and Corey will be leaping out of the plane harnessed to Kyle and Ryan, two civilian skydiving instructors. And the count's going to be ready, set, go, right? After the paratroopers jump at 1,200 feet, Joe will climb to 12,000 feet, where Mikey and Corey will do a free fall tandem jump. Feel the air between your fingers. Yay. All cool beans. Adjust my hat. <laughs> Adjust your hat. <laughs> and when we get down to the bottom side of it, I'm going to open up the parachute, and we'll talk about landing after that, OK? And then we'll just be hanging out? We're going to be hanging out. All right, cool. Unless it really goes shit house. <laughs> It'll be fun. It'll be fun. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> they look a little nervous, right? <laughs> oh, I'm just, yeah, no. They don't ask about Mikey's weight, so he doesn't tell. <laughs> he also neglects to mention his fear of heights. A year ago, Mikey faced his fear by dangling off the edge of the CN Tower. Uh, yeah, on. Hey, buddies. They're watching you, too. Good. How are you feeling? Uh, it's quite interesting. <laughs> quite interesting. Right? Today, he's going to be 10,000 feet higher, and he's got to jump. And you think yeah. you're shitting bricks? Try it with a rucksack and a gun, man. You're yeah, jumping over land that you've never been to before. Yeah. Right? That shit is still there. I see that. Late afternoon. Everyone's still waiting for the storm clouds to clear. Well, I'm looking right at the direction I got to go to get to my jump zone. I don't know why all that cloud's moving in. The plane is going to be coming in from the south on its jump run uh, to the north. The ceiling is dropping right now, and we need 1,250 feet uh, for them to drop safely. Uh, this rain started to roll in, and so we'll see it as about 40 minutes to clear out. For the, uh, for the Canadians here, you have an American next to you. Back in the hangar, it's 10 minutes to take off. Mm, it's going to be bumpy up there, right? Eh? I'm going to get some gravel, because we're going to be tossed around so bad. So how are you feeling now? More nervous, less nervous? I will do my Just a slight bit more. <laughs> when you get motor, make sure you put these over your eyes before we leave the aircraft. Um, make sure that when we do leave, they're on tight. When I say tight, I mean 120 mile an hour tight. <laughs> This is going to be the perfect storm. Yes, very nice. There's going to be an hour in that airplane bouncing around. <laughs> Let's go have some fun, Richard. Oh, my man. Good to go? Yeah, I think so. All right, guys, we'll see you up there. Enjoy the fall, Mike. Bye. Hey, see you guys up there. You're going to love it, man. So this is it. All the hard work, all the time. It's all come down to this, so. It's one of those moments where I I'm speechless. I never thought I'd be doing this. The weather's crazy. The location's crazy. We're in a 70-year-old airplane. What the hell can happen? OK, Mike. Here you come. 5 PM, D-Day. Mikey's long-planned mission is finally a go. OK, grab a seat. Be cautious of your ripcord handle. Yeah. 24 elite members of the Canadian Forces and US Green Berets are locked and loaded. This is uh, pretty badass. If we did this on the daily schedule, we'd get more people in. <laughs> <laughs> Newbie co-pilot Sam Storm boards the biggest flight of his young career. Third month of flying. They're fully checked the oil, check the gas. Yep, the full mains, 50 in the rear, 20 gallons of oil each engine. Well, the last time this was done would have been in the 40s. That's been a while, so it's getting pretty excited. Shit's getting real, so. 
In Red Deer, the skies have cleared, but the mountain drop site still looks stormy. You're jumping uh, 24 Special Forces, and you got your son on board. And of course, Corey has been with us 21 years, which is longer than any kid stays at home. I really have two sons jumping on the airplane. So we all had a responsibility and obligation to do it safely. And 405 rolling to report. Oh, Roger. We're on our way. 60 knots. Be on. Be two. Oh, you're yeah, good. Uh, at this point, I don't really even care about my jump as much as I care about the military's jump and all the veterans and people that are waiting. So, if it's possible, we have to try. I see a little window over there. The wind's pushing the clouds to the south, so as long as the bird comes on station at the right time, we should be good to go. But deeper into the mountains, uh, down that way. visibility is dropping. Yeah, what I probably want to do is I go up 8,000 over top of it, look at it, and drop. But I can't get over there because of the cloud. What's the highest one I got to get over? As long as you, uh, 66, as long as you stay through here. I think we actually, uh, when we go in, we'll take a right. Get right into the cloud there, though, right? Yeah. Joe will need room to turn around and climb out, but with low visibility and high winds, he could find a mountain blocking his way. What's the highest in, uh, in the back? How high are they? What am I going in at? Then they go up to 95. Oh, gee. I can't see through there, right? Uh, I'm not going to go in there. Can't see enough in there. I didn't like it, and of course, I make my decision on if I can come back out. That's the only decision I can make. It didn't feel good, so I turned around. He delivers the bad news to Mikey. How you going to do it? I can't get in there. Check it in. Oh, man, so close. I'm, I'm pretty bummed. Yes, I know. All that hard work. Yeah, it's Abraham Jump, it's uh, Bird Dog 3, we're returning to Red Deer. Yeah, I'm unable to get in at this time, unable at this time. You copy. Drops on Abraham Lake, uh, good copy. Uh, we'll shut down here. Over. Okay, tell the guys to wrap it up, let's go back. Definitely a lot of disappointed people right now. And four pop. 80 over 82. Well, boys, I'm sorry. It happens. Even on an invasion that day, 70 years ago, it would depend upon the weather. You know, they had a very small window to do it in. The D-Day invasion was originally planned for June 5th, 1944. A cold front pushing in from the northwest means the probable building up of thunderheads in this area and soon. Allied meteorologists predicted a narrow window of good weather on June 6th. And so at the last minute, the entire invasion was rescheduled. I can only imagine that the Royal Air Force and the Canadian Air Force and the Air Corps had a thousand of these things up, you know, 70 years ago and trying to get one. All we want is one. 70 years later, the boys of Buffalo faced the same predicament. Well, you're going to get a much better weather at 7 in the morning and do it at 7 at night. The weather's supposed to clear overnight. High pressure area come in and get rid of that wind. There's a narrow weather window tomorrow morning. It's, everything's good on the ground. It's just the turbulence in the air right now. It's our backup plan. The only problem is, is we only have a small window in the morning to do it. It was normally done in a day. So 
So, uh, Matt, just what's the weather looking like there? It's like low, low lying, the fog patches. 6 a.m. June 6th. Mikey and the paratroopers are hoping to take advantage of a small break in the weather. You say there's fog in the valleys? More like mist or dew, but uh, there's everywhere around there's no clouds. So if I flew over top the drop zone at 9,000 feet, I could see you straight down then. 9,000 feet straight down, you can see the drop zone. Oh yeah. There you go, stand up, take your on. If they can't jump today, there won't be any more chances. Hey, hey, how you doing? It's going to be ready, set, and then roll off the plane with me, okay? Yeah. Mikey's fear of heights is getting worse the longer they wait. Clear as mud, right? Oh, yeah. That was good. You know, the more you sit, the more your brain goes, and your brain's your worst enemy. You know, fear's not real. It's danger is, and sometimes the danger makes the fear in your brain, you know, larger and larger as you sit there, so. Are they looking good in the back? Have a thumbs up. Today, hopefully, we'll get this done. This is the first time I've really seen Mikey nervous. He just didn't seem his giggly, funny, goofy self. He seemed very serious about the whole thing. Looks clear over there. That's, that's how he's drop zone, eh? Yeah, that's the lake. At Abraham Lake, the drop zone team is about to set up. Fuel up right now. If you need fuel, it will get on the water. OK. Good. Now, max wind reading so far today has been one knot. Yeah, there they are. We just got visual on them. Which one of your four boats is the A boat? Our boat is marked with fuchsia paddle marker. What's he saying? It's got uh, fuchsia markers. What's that? Uh, like a, a pinkish color. You're the pink boat, Metal of Lake, are you? Drop zone, good copy. We are the pink boat, Middle of Lake. Paratroopers drop low and fast, so Joe has to put them right on the target. Don't have that much steerage net, eh? Nope. You're pretty well going straight now. Pretty much. I'm going to have a guy on the head boat, and he is going to let you know when we throw the streamers, just so we know what uh, the winds are like on the water and if we have to offset it all. On the first pass, they drop a streamer to check the plane's position. Probably the more stressful flying I've done in a long time, where I, I was really concentrating on a lot of things to make sure a lot of things happened right. Hey, the boat is just coming up in my window now. Hey, here comes the streamer now. We're just going to let the streamer go. Hey, streamers are out. All right. I need you to push your aircraft on the same bearing, but 300 meters to the west use the center of the lake as a reference point. OK, we'll be uh, directly over your boat. Get ready! Welcome! Welcome! The command is given to stand up and hook up, and then the paratroops pour out of the planes as fast as they can. In the hours before dawn on June 6, 1944, 23,000 paratroopers were dropped behind enemy lines. It was estimated that only 50% of personnel would be available for use after the landing. High winds meant less than 10% hit their intended drop zone. This calculated risk was accepted. About 1 in 10 didn't make it home. But their sacrifice proved to be the turning point in the war. Okay, slowing down for the turn. This time, Joe has to nail it. Yeah, you gotta get a little more into the middle of the lake again. Okay, just call my turn. Got you. And we're at 12.50 above the lake, 120 knots. Veterans, including some from D-Day itself, have come to witness this rare and historic jump. Oh, 
Drops on Abraham Lake, winds from 360 at three knots. Drop zone clear, drop. Check's out of line! Check's out of line! Step on! The boat is under my airplane. I'm getting nervous now. Is the line going to hold? Is the brackets right? You know, if someone gets hung up, is the retrieval system going to work? All this shit's going through your brain, right? Like. Joe needed to get close to the boat, but his aim was a little bit too good. He's gonna land on us. Yeah. This guy is. Oh, slip! 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 Slip right! Ah! <laughs> Hold! Come on, Jelly! Oh, you're on away. Right there. Where do you wanna go? That way. Right here? Go. That's what I see. For Mikey and Corey's free fall jump, Joe needs to get above 12,000 feet, 10 times higher than he is now. Okay, take your timing on our climb here. Okay. 1042 is our start. And then all of a sudden, airplane speeds up, we start climbing. There's nothing left but us now. I'm doing okay. I'm happy Corey's here. I'm scared shitless. Mikey doesn't look so good. <laughs> Mikey look a little sick. Oh, yeah. When we cinch up and my father comes back, he's like, you sure you want to do this? And I was like, Dad, we came this far. I'm not turning back. You got to double check your hardest thing. Oh, yeah. You're going to be jumping in 10 minutes. He doesn't want to see. 1,000 feet to go, we're at 11 five. Check. I just kept on telling myself, man, fear's not real. You just need one step. One step. One thousand feet to go, we're at 11.5. Check. 12,000 feet above Abraham Lake, Alberta, Mikey and Corey are about to have the ultimate rush, each strapped to a skydive instructor. Gonna be good, gonna be good. I can't wait till it's his turn to drop. <laughs> Corey's mom and dad have come to witness the occasion. We're just watching the plane. You got it? Yep. OK. My parents were there. You know, my grandfather was paratrooper. He took part in D-Day. So for me, it meant a little more, because that's what he did. He did the same airplane you know, at that, you know, that day. Like, it's, it's a big deal, right? I mean, that's a lot of history behind this thing. Okay, guys, we're starting our current northbound. We're coming up 12 4. Ready for that? Yep, yeah, ready. Get on, sir. Hey, we got the drop zone in sight. We're going directly towards it. Okay, slow down here. Joe slows down to 100 knots, and it's time to jump. We get the position, and he's like, one, two, three. And away we went. 
fine, but someone came up. I just kept on telling myself, man, fear's not real. It's just telling you not to do things, and we just gotta do it. Time just stopped. I just remember saying, I'm skydiving. Oh my God. I see three parachutes. As I turned around, um, I knew I was looking for four chutes. I could only find three. Have you keep the turn going? Down easy. I see one big red one. Another red one. I don't see those guys. Greatest moments of my life is sitting there. That's the moment that it all paid off. Woo! Yeah, get ready, grab that speed for me, and lift them up high. Landing was flawless. Ours was perfect. <laughs> it was awesome compared to Mikey's. Typical Mikey fashion. Everything works well until the very last second. <laughs> now I can see his rocks, grass, and Corey smiling. You all right? Oh, yeah, I'm good. How was it, man? Awesome, man. Oh. Awesome. Good work. I get up. Corey and I uh, congratulating each other, and of course my phone rings. <laughs> Hello. Yeah, we're all good. Yes, all good. I guess he didn't count the proper number of shoots and all that stuff, but we are safe. Roger, Roger. I got, I got, what do you got? This was your granddad's airborne wings. Oh really? Oh, because he kidding? jumped out. I got my wings though. Even though it was a tandem jump, there's your wings. Yeah. I, I, think, I think your old father would be proud. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> so happy, oh my god. Cheers. To D-Day. To D-Day. The last, you know, six years, I've, I've got to do some awesome things. This was by far the craziest thing that I've ever tried to accomplish. Where are they? People are just on the shoreline there. For 40 years, Buffalo Airways has defied frigid cold, convention, oh, look at this. and time itself. Oh. Woo. So do you see them all waving? Yeah, they're all waving. Frontiers like these are made for people like Joe McBrien, people who defy the odds, push through, and just get it done.